Hello, well, welcome to our um, thriving or uh, navigating through uh, volatility webinar series uh, sponsored by LMA Consulting. And uh, we'd like to kick off um, our webinar series to, uh, to handle this, um, uh, you know, this coronavirus pandemic and how do we um, successfully navigate through and also how do we uh, prepare so we can come out the other end um, successfully and um, ready to uh, ramp up quickly. Uh, so Apex Inland Empire, uh, we're excited to offer this webinar series uh, to our members and sponsors and business partners. And we'd love for your feedback and uh, input. So with that said, I'm gonna kick it off uh, with uh, Alan Dunn. Alan Dunn is uh, president of GDI Consulting and Training Company. And he's the founding sponsor of Manufacturing Executive Institute, uh, a manufacturing industry training partner with state-of-the-art classroom and web enabled training facilities in Southern California. He also served as, a chair, as the chair of the Association for Supply Chain Management in 2015. So he has lots of, uh, lots of experience with our um, um, chapter needs. So uh, before founding GDI, uh, Alan was vice president of Gemini Management Consulting and a partner at Coopers and Librand. Uh, and he has vast experience beyond that. So we would, we really welcome you, Alan. We appreciate you doing this webinar and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Lisa. I'd like to thank the Apex Inland Empire chapter and then LMA Consulting also for inviting me to speak on this uh, incredibly um, difficult matter in this very, uh, these very tough times. Today's program is uh, weathering the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on global supply chain. And as Lisa indicated, this is part of the Navigating Through Volatility webinar series that her, her company is sponsoring with the Apex Empire chapter. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about this subject for better than a month now. Uh, all of us in the professional services business uh, who travel a lot um, don't travel a lot. In fact, we don't travel at all right now. Everybody in my industry who's had um, scheduled events, those events have been canceled. So we've all had a lot of time to be thinking about this. Uh, the only exception for me is that I sit on a number of boards of directors of manufacturing companies, and it's been nonstop emergency uh, board meetings and phone calls one right after the other to try to deal with the myriad of issues that have come up during this entire program or this entire uh, crisis. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about this today. Now, I'm kind of reducing the amount of uh, footprint or uh, internet footprint, bandwidth footprint here. So I apologize for the static pictures of myself, even though we have me up in the, the corner of our virtual earth there. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have about 150 million people now uh, in the workforce in the U.S. We have about 50 million of those people that seem to be working at home now and their kids seem to be going to school online and when everybody's not working, they seem to be watching YouTube, Netflix, or, or Hulu. And so bandwidth has become a huge premium. I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about that uh, later in the program. But this whole uh, uh, crisis is, uh, there's a number of important issues we have to deal with. Probably the three most important are that these are unusual times and none of us, none of us, not one of us has a rule book that we can turn to a chapter or a page or a section to try to get an answer for what to do. Uh, there's not just one issue that we're all facing or two issues, there's literally hundreds of interlocking or interconnecting issues that we're all addressing. Second reason this is important is that companies, an enormous number of companies are either going to weather this crisis, survive it, die, or perhaps even find a way to prosper. I've jokingly said that in earthquakes or hurricanes or tornadoes, um, it's, those are all bad, uh, but being a rougherer in the construction business during those moments in time, probably not such a bad place to be. This crisis, this COVID-19 crisis, is going to have some opportunities. In fact, I will predict that there is going to be wholesale transformation of the manufacturing industry in North America. North America, when I, I really should probably say the Americas, that would be Canada, uh, Mexico, and the U.S. So the, how you view risk, it turns out, we think is going to be the major determinant of how you get through this crisis. In some way, manufacturing will ultimately recover. The real issue here is it's kind of this industrial chess game 
of how and where will it recover and and uh, who will be the winners and who will be the losers. So we want to try to give you some tangible solutions to this issue today. Now let's really go back, rewind just a little bit and talk about what's really happened here because everybody thinks it's purely COVID-19. It's purely the coronavirus uh, problem. It is not just the coronavirus problem. Uh, when when uh, leaders decided to shut down commerce, uh, national as well as international commerce, it became far more than uh, just a virus and a pandemic, although that's plenty. Well, let's really go back to the beginning of the third quarter of last year and the global oil crisis internationally, largely as a result of Saudi Arabia, uh, their intent to put inefficient oil producers out of business. They did that successfully with Venezuela, although the Venezuelans helped quite a bit. They uh, have done that with a number of other countries and producers. And of course, now they've targeted Russia. Russia produces oil that they sell into the European markets. I get a lot of oil updates because I sit on the board of directors of a large liquid asphalt company, uh, probably one of the largest in the United States. And we get regular updates on what's going on in the oil industry because at the end of the day, asphalt is just a residual element of oil. So how oil goes, asphalt goes, as asphalt goes, uh, building, road building and construction goes as well. And so we've, we started to see back in the beginning of the third quarter, we started to see this oil crisis developing. And that's really important to understand because that created chaos in the world. And that chaos in the world started to impact the markets and also started to impact the currency traders. Oil has for a long time at times been used as a hedge against currencies. And when it starts to drop wildly, the hedging positions obviously change. So that then started to feed a little bit of another problem that was actually building all on its own. And that was the margin calls in Wall Street. So think about since 2016, we've had a dramatic increase in the stock values and the values of all equities in uh, North America in particular. And uh, companies were buying, investors were borrowing to buy more stock. And that's not unusual, it's buying on margin, it's done. But uh, if the stock goes down, you have a margin call and you have to repay that um, or effectively the equivalent of being foreclosed on your, your equities. And so as the stock price started to drop as a result of the chaos in the global oil markets, uh, we started to see uh, margin calls or at least the threat of margin calls. So stock started to be sold in uh, big dumps. Usually in December of every year, there's a reduction in the equities simply because of balancing of pension plans and things like that by the in big institutional investors. In this case, the more you sold to avoid a margin call, the more others sold to avoid their margin calls and it snowballed. And then on top of that, then COVID-19 comes along right around the end of the fourth quarter of last year. I won't go through all of the issues with this because that we're inundated on television with this and radio literally by the minute, uh, but it has effectively caused a shutdown of global commerce. Some countries more than others. Most countries, most industrialized countries have come to a grinding halt. And this is really serious because this is basically shut down. Just go out and drive the streets. And so, well, actually not supposed to do that, but, but if you go out on the streets, you'll see what I mean. Um, businesses are shut down. Restaurants are shut down. Bars are shut down. Uh, Non-essential companies are supposed to be shut down. Um, a friend of mine just sent me some photographs from downtown New York City today, Manhattan, and it looks like a ghost town. It's, it looks like a scary science fiction movie. And so the three of these, this trifecta of global oil chaos, margin calls, and global commerce shutdown has created an enormous problem. Let me share with you how big that problem is. In 2008, an internal report by the World Bank estimated that an impact of a mild flu or pandemic at about seven-tenths of a percent of global GDP, a moderate pandemic would create about a 2% reduction in global GDP and a severe outbreak, nearly 5%. That would be the difference between a slowdown, a downturn, and a global recession as deep as the GDP decline happened in the 2008-9 financial meltdown. Well, we're well on a path to beat that three or four times over, maybe even more than that. And so with predictions coming out of five major banks last night of an unemployment rate exceeding 30%, uh, GDP dropping 30 to 50 percent. Um, uh, this isn't scaremongering. These are the top folks at Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Dimensional Fund, Vanguard Fund, State Streets, etc. They are predicting enormous, enormous drops 
in GDP and increases in unemployment. So here's something I want you all to get your heads around. I want you to wrap your heads around. We spent an enormous time researching this and, and uh, while we don't know everything because it's impossible, because it's changing by the minute, we have at least a sense of direction. I may not know how to drive to Seattle, but I know it's north. And so I know, have, have a sense of where this is going. So it is important to be realistic about the potential duration, not of the virus itself, but the duration of the extraordinary new business cycle that you're, you and your company are now thrust into. This is not a time for priorities to be driven by strategy and hope. Responsible supply chain leaders and indeed CEOs, while remaining optimistic, must assume a worst case economic cycle. You heard it here. I'm saying I believe it's prudent. I hope it doesn't, it's not necessary. This is one of those things in life that we, if one says one should be very happy to be wrong, but we need to assume a worst case economic cycle. It's time to get real and it's, and it's time not to just be sitting around thinking about long-term strategy when survival for a lot of organizations is going to be the most critical aspect of their life for the next maybe six months to a year or more. So COVID-19 is going to change where supply chain leaders focus their time and attention. Now, thanks to organizations like APEX and thanks to organizations like uh, the, the uh, Inland Empire chapter of APEX, thanks to professionals uh, like Lisa, who, who helps companies and myself and others in our industry, uh, we have become excellent at planning and execution. Oh my goodness, where would they... Where would companies, manufacturing companies be if it wasn't for the planning and execution excellence developed by Apex professionals and by supply chain professionals? And so planning and execution has been absolutely what we live, eat, and breathe every single day. But now as leaders, we need to, for a period of time, stop worrying about planning and execution. Yes, you have to keep the trains running. Yes, you have to keep the business running. But within the next week, everybody listening to this really needs to get their priorities, their company's priorities in order. Priorities, priorities, priorities are what we need to think about today. Now there's eight supply chain leaders priorities, and this is the sequence that I think we should all work on. And I'm gonna go through each of these individually, but I'll just summarize them quick. So our first priority is about human safety of our employees, and of course our family, friends, and loved ones. But as employers, we have to really think about the safety of our employees more than we ever have before. Uh, and, and for a lot of reasons. One is that when the quarantines are lifted, we have to have companies to come back to and what are companies if they're not a composite of a number of people and, and, and human groups. Second is that in the next 72 hours, everybody listening to this really needs to take their company and do a wall-to-wall -wall realistic assessment of risks. I'll give you a week, but 72 hours is about what it ought to take. We need to do assessments of the risks. And I'll talk about those risks in a, bit, in a bit. Third is preservation of capital. And remember, these are in order. So preservation of capital is about how to maintain and retain the amount of money that you currently have. And then you'll see later, it's all about liquidity, liquidity, and liquidity. The fourth is to, is to do an assessment and really understand uh, your continuity of demand and supply. What customers can you keep? What customers are you going to lose? And perhaps even what customers should you lose? And notice I didn't say supply and demand. I said demand and supply because demand comes first. Because without demand, there's no value to the supply. Remember, supply without demand is called inventory. And inventory is the giant sucking sound of capital, which doesn't work well for number three, where we're trying to preserve capital. Number five, is open your mind to this destruction of business models. We will come out of this and some business models will be destroyed. I would not wanna be in the airline business, not just because 85% of all commercial aircraft are parked in the US right now, it's the latest number that came out about an hour and a half ago, but because if you have the world communicating in meetings like this via Skype or via video conferencing, Zoom, go to meeting, WebEx, etc. If you get them used to this uh, solidly for three or four months, uh, you may have, see some business travel is being reduced, and that's where all the profits come from the airlines. The sixth is manage regulatory compliance. Uh, that'll be a very provocative tub, uh, subject when I get to it, uh, because uh, just kind of a heads up, I'm going to suggest that everything 
that you're expected to comply to, you may not be complying because it may not fit into your current priorities. And we'll talk about that. Uh, once one through six uh, is you kind of accomplishing those and you're moving down the path on those, then you can uh, widen your eyes and start looking for those new business models and new opportunities. Uh, I have seen whole industries grow out of catastrophes. Our company, uh, for example, does supplier performance and risk assessments for companies. They're overseas suppliers. And while we're not doing any of those right now for obvious reasons, the reality was is that the 2008-9 crash created that market. It created a market where companies needed to have suppliers that were economically viable as well as operationally viable. And so businesses grow out of catastrophes and out of calamity. And the eighth is about the enterprise transformation. How are you going to transform your enterprise to take advantage of, well, effectively number seven? So this is not just a supply, nor is it a demand only problem. In fact, it's, it's, there's more, way more to it than that. It's gonna be a logistics problem. It's gonna be a capital availability problem. It's gonna be a credit availability problem, um, not just for people, but for, uh, for companies. And so you can't shut an economy down. You can't send everybody home and, and expect the economy to not be an enormous drain on the monetary system. And so we're gonna talk about that. Look, there's laws of math, there's laws of gravity, there's laws of nature, and there's laws of economics. And the economics says, if, the, if you have more money going out than you have coming in, at some point in time, there's gonna be a cash freeze. And when there's a cash freeze, there's ultimately a credit freeze. So let's talk about human safety. Let's go through these one at a time. So I want you to first in human safety to fully engage your HES, health, edu uh, environmental and safety, and your IT organizations. Now, fully engaging the HES organization means that you get them involved in dealing with how do we pay people if they're not working? How do we make sure people distance themselves at work? How do we make sure that we have the proper number of washing stations? How do we make sure that the people that we hired that haven't started yet who quit their other job, a client that that just came up with this morning, um, how do we deal with that? I mean, there are people that get caught in those cracks. But you also need to get your IT organization in place. So in the last nine days, I've talked to easily two or 300 people in companies about how this is affecting them and how it's affecting their companies. And here's one thing that they all say, working at home works as long as the systems that support us work. People are crashing, their IT systems are crashing all over the place. Um, go to meeting is crashing all over the place. We use that and we've had to switch to some others temporarily while they solve some of the server uh, issues, which they've done and been incredibly responsive. This is no organization's fault. This is an extraordinary time. And so we're finding that people are going home and it takes them three, five days to get themselves connected. And even then they can't hold the meetings, they, the, the system's free. So your IT organization and your HES organization should probably practically be sleeping on cots next to their desks. These people need, I mean, they are going to help us keep the trains running on time in our organizations. The second issue about human safety is to try to move people not out of the workplace, but away from one another. So we need to move people around. So I have a client in, uh, down in Tijuana, and they, they took out every uh, second and third worker on the assembly line. So there's a good eight feet between everybody. And obviously that has slowed down the, the process and the outflow. But as the CEO said to me, he goes, it doesn't make any difference because our demand has dropped in half anyways. And so it's a non-essential item. And so, uh, so they've, they've balanced the lines uh, by stretching out the people. And so that's, so the work locations, having people work at home, these are things we're going to do. Some of the work methods are different. Um, my clients are now telling me that one, I mean, again, the hundreds of people I talked to said, people keep asking me for signatures and they keep telling me that a digital signature isn't good enough. Well, my friends, <laughs> digital signature has to be good enough because we're not gonna run documents around uh, these days. So there's gonna be changes in work methods as well. So one of my clients, for example, a pharmaceutical company just pulled all of their paper work orders or batch records, they call them in the pharma industry, pulled all those out of the factories and replaced them with tablets. And so all the work data, all the work instructions, all the quality checks, everything is now a tablet that can be easily wiped down and sanitized every day. 
paper, remember, is a terrible carrier of pathogens. And so they've, and they, by the way, they made that switch in one week. In one week, the IT organization cranked it up and they made it in one week. There was uh, not a lot of bureaucracy in front of them. Of course, we have to pay extra attention to workplace hygiene and make sure people wash their hands. My sister is a nurse, uh, uh, an, an ICU nurse up in Oregon. And she was telling me last night that uh, she said, look, here's the, here's the message. Tell people to wash their hands. Um, literally, every time they get up from their desk, if they go and they touch anything, have them wash their hands. You don't need a lot of fancy stuff. You just need soap, 20 seconds, and a, and a tune in your mind to hum for 20 seconds that reminds you that you've done it for 20 seconds. You need friction. And so friction and soap breaks down the outer walls of the cells. Uh, now, now you know the extent of my biology, but uh, I'm trusting her and that seems to be working. Uh, social distancing we talked about. And here's one that's really important. A number of companies I talked to said, you know, we just have some people that just show up, they won't go home. And, uh, and so there's this term we call presentism. And that means that person who believes that their value is determined by being at work. And so they'll come and they'll cough and they'll hack and, and they'll sneeze all over everything and all over everybody, but by golly, they're at work. So don't fire them, just send them home and tell them if they don't go home and work at home or stay at home, then they will be fired. But you can't have them come to work out of that misplaced value system. And by the way, if that value system exists, uh, you might have created it. So it's time to change your own mindset there too. It's time for leaders. It's not time for administrators. It's not time for managers. It's time for leaders. Leadership needs to be firm, but fair, it needs to be clear, and it needs to be compassionate. So I want you to remember, companies compete for talent today as much as they compete for customers. This is not going to go away. This is going to be a truism even when we come back. So at 3% unemployment or 3.5% unemployment eight weeks ago, wow, what a difference eight weeks makes, right? To 20% or whatever it is today, 10, I don't know what it is today, it's hard to tell. Um, though you're still gonna compete to get your existing employees back. As one HR executive said to me just yesterday, said, you know, Alan, they're all sitting at home at working and every once in a while they go to LinkedIn, they go to, um, quick recruit or whatever that uh, zip recruit, they go to all those sites and they look around because they know companies are gonna be switching people around. And so they're looking for other opportunities and it's so easy to do. So let's treat them right in order to keep them. The second thing, let's talk about that real, realistic assessment of risks. I want you to do an analysis of the risk of losing your necessary people and the ones you can't lose. And every company has one or two or several of these. You need to put a plan in place. And I don't care if it's not fair to everybody else. This is not a time to be dealing with that universal fairness question. This is a time to look at the, the two, the five, the 10, the 20 individuals you just cannot lose, absolutely cannot lose and expect to come back out of this. So you need to put together a program to ad ad address their needs. I also want you to think about losing supply, both internal and external. Interestingly enough, most of my clients are telling me they're working well with their suppliers. It's their internal, the other division of their companies that seem to be the problems. And I'm getting more and more comments of the internal bureaucracies than the external bureaucracies. It seems like uh, external suppliers are very interested in keeping a customer relationship and, uh, and your purchasing organizations are very interested in keeping those critical suppliers in line. But it seems like everybody who buys from a sister division Looks, on, looks at them one way or the other as competition. And we can't have that. We can't have that. Supply is supply. So let's switch real quick to talk about risk of losing demand. And I'm going to come back to supply a little bit later with something that's going to surprise you, a recommendation. But I want to go to demand. So obviously you have customers and you have channels. You have to deal with both of those, both your customers and the, the, the distribution channels, both in and out of your business. Um, but I really want you to pay attention how much inventory is building in those channels because you may have a delay of effect when the marketplace starts to come back if your channel is stuffed you may have another two weeks five weeks ten weeks even a year i i have a client that probably has a channel because of bad bad past behaviors probably has a channel stuffed with four to six months of demand and so thinking their factory is going to start up if this lifts 
in the end of June, thinking their factory is going to start up in July, is probably a, a, a wish more than its reality. I also want you to think about the capital risks. I want you to do an assessment. So this whole page is about doing assessments. It's not about solving problems. It's about doing an assessment of how to solve the problems. So I want you to look at your capital situation now, your payables, your receivable, your available capital, your cash, et cetera. I also want you to do take a look at the compliance issues and we're gonna come back and talk more about that in a bit. But I really want you to take a look at the compliance issues that you can push out. That's really what that means without impacting human safety um, uh, or shareholder value too much. So we'll talk more about that. So here's your action. In the next 72 hours, I would encourage all of you to put a team, a couple teams together, maybe four or five teams, one that looks at employees, one that looks at suppliers, one that looks at customers, one that looks at capital, one that looks at compliance, and give them 72 hours to put together a comprehensive risk assessment. And you won't know how to do that because virtually everybody listening to this has been through some sort of lean uh, Six Sigma uh, uh, reliability quality management program, and you've learned failure modes effects analysis or FMEA. There's no better tool to apply to this than FMEA. So, and it's a relatively simple tool. If you don't know it or don't remember it, there's only about 22,000 YouTube videos on this subject. So go find one and uh, take a look at that. Or call people like myself or Lisa or others or your local Apex chapter. There's somebody that understands this. So you, there's no reason, uh, you don't have to worry about forms and templates and things like that. It's a pretty straightforward issue. Let's go to preservation of capital. I said earlier it's about liquidity, 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 and let's start with ensuring your leverage capacity. Leverage means your debt capacity. So here's one of the things I recommend you all consider doing. I can't tell you to do it, but I'm telling you to consider doing it. Boards of directors I've done, sit on, we've already done this. Banks are encouraging you not to do it for obvious reasons. But if you have any of your remaining credit line available, borrow it up, borrow it up, go get it. So if you have a $10 million line of credit and you're $4 million into it, go get the other 6 million, put it in a bank and pay the bank, your first bank interest on it. Because we have at least, in most professionals' opinions, we have at least a 50% probability of a, at least a temporary credit freeze. In 2008, we saw this when companies went to borrow on their revolving line of credit and the bank said, I can't release any capital to you because if I did, it'll put me in my loan loss reserve ratio, or put me out of my loan loss reserve ratios. And so that's what froze up credit and that's what hurt a lot of companies. And so and that's, by the way, why the feds had to get involved because in a sense, that would have stopped commerce um, much like what we've done now. So in reverse, we stop commerce at some point in time, this is gonna happen. Look, tomorrow is the witching hour that we all worry about. Tomorrow is the day that rents are due, car payments are due, mortgage payments are due, and there's already huge rumblings that, uh, that companies aren't gonna be paying their rents and that people aren't gonna be paying their mortgages because they don't have the money to do it. And so as, as a, as a uh, insurance policy, I would encourage you to look at this. Get, get a team together in your company and look at it. Get ahead on need any lender covenant failure. So if you think you're gonna pop a covenant on your bank debt this week, next month, the next quarter, get ahead of it, meet with your bankers, explain, work on it, get it waived, do what you've gotta do, but do that now. Do not wait for that to be a surprise because if that comes as a surprise, it'll be uh, at least a 50% probability of when credit is frozen and you won't have any negotiating position. I also want you to reprioritize all non-essential CapEx projects. Now, I'm not saying eliminate them. I'm not saying cancel them. I'm saying reprioritize them. So even safety projects, if they aren't in a huge short-term risk of creating a problem, you need to reprioritize that. Now, typically safety and environmental go to the top of every list because those functions are driven by purely by a moral imperative, not by an economic imperative. But there is a set of economics to those. So every continuous improvement project, every expansion project, everything probably needs to be reprioritized 
Um, and you might move some stuff up. You might move some safety stuff up and some others back. The point is, is that you can't go with the plan you had on December 15th. The next is push hard on all collections. Don't be afraid to make uh, deals with, uh, with customers to get your money. And this is an interesting one. Protect your supplier's liquidity. I want everybody who's listening to this to not go and beat up your suppliers for price reductions. I do not want you to beat them up. You're going to need them. Let's learn from past mistakes. A supplier, particularly a critical supplier, you need to think of them as a work center, just not inside your factory. And you need to have an appreciation of that outsourced work center, if you will. And you need to not, not go beat them up on price. Now, go work on terms and conditions, maybe stretch out some payment terms, or as one of my clients is doing, they've accelerated the payment term, terms to those suppliers that they absolutely want to be on the winning side with when this is all over. In other words, they know that there's going to be a bullwhip. That's a term that everybody in supply chain should be familiar with. There's going to be a bullwhip, and they want to make sure that they're not the one getting cracked. They want to make sure they're the one that's getting the supply. So I would encourage you to not, to not build your, the theme of supplier management this time on lower cost suppliers. I would build it on protecting the liquidity of suppliers. Also take advantage of every government uh, program, every money program. If you're a small manufacturer, go get every SBA uh, loan or low cost loan. You can get, do everything you can. And then I want you to renew your budgets and obviously cut expenses. So your budget uh, on December 15th of last year for this year um, is, is invalid now. You have to go back and take a look at it. So the action is immediately assign a team to determine and access every source of available capital and also the capital uh, preservation responsibilities, including where you cut costs. So that takes us to an idea for cutting costs. Lisa, you raised your hand. Did you have something to say? Uh, or no, just just waving just, at me. Just, uh, I guess I just raised my hand by accident. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't, I want to make sure. You had a but question. if anybody does have a question, it's a good time to say that, Alan. If you do have a question, send it in through the uh, Q and A or the chat box, and I will um, break in it uh, in the future and ask Alan. So thank you, right. Alan. Keep going. Great information. Good. Good little break there. So another action is I want you to immediately execute a comprehensive value analysis. We call it an activity value analysis. This is value engineering, kind of industrial engineering 101. I want you to take a look at every plant, manufacturing plant, every product, every function, every activity. And I want you to look at those and I want you to look at how much time and effort is spent on each of those activities. If you look at the bottom right-hand side of the screen, you'll see an activity chart for a tire rubber treatment forming work center. And you'll see there's seven activities and then you'll see there's uh, three columns, VA, NVA, and NVAR. VA is value added, NVA is non-value added, and NVAR is non-value added required. Non-value added required, by the way, are those activities that you have to do whether you want to do them or not, like pay taxes. And so, or calculate your taxes. And so the percentages in each of those boxes those represent the percent of time that one takes. In the bottom, very bottom right-hand corner of that blue box is the total cost of the work center. So if I take a look at the third line down, uh, the scrap that's coming out of this work center is about 18% of all the time and effort is somehow involved in processing, identifying, quality assuring, producing, throwing away, whatever. All the activities associated with scrap management come out to about 18%, and that comes out to you know, about 200 and over $270,000 um, as 18% of that total $1.5 million or roughly $5 million. And so you do this for every department, every function, every work center. I mean, I'm literally talking from the, the top of the organization to the bottom or start at the bottom and move your way to the top. And I want you to identify the value added, the non-value added, and then I want you to go and use that to drive your expense reduction. Don't just do what everybody does in these times, they go through their business and they just say, well, let's just cut every department by 20%. And you know that that doesn't work that way. Vilfredo Pareto in the 16th century told us it doesn't work that way, that 20% uh, of your expenses are coming 
or activities rather are causing 20% of your expenses. And, and there's always a disproportionality. Cut the disproportionalities, don't cut everything. Ultimately, because at the top of this sheet, you see that operating cash flow or gross assets. What you're trying to do is to reduce, reduce the total gross asset base of your business. So get rid of stuff you don't need. Close down plants if you don't need them. Consolidate plants, consolidate offices. If you think people are never going to come back because they're going to work at their house, then you might shut down some offices. But at the end of the day, you need to work on that numerator. You need to increase the cash flow. You're not going to increase it by sales. At least most companies aren't right now, but you can increase it by cutting. Then I want you to work on the continuity of demand and supply. And so the continuity of demand and supply means that you have to really go out there and focus on your customer's ability to pay. That's actually where it starts. So you look at your existing customers and you're going to evaluate their ability to pay. And, the one, and you're gonna discover that some of your biggest customers are some of the ones that are likely hurt the most. And so you're gonna to have to try to figure out a plan for how you work with them and so you don't lose them. This is an, an opportunity to build a loyalty with certain customers, maybe through, again, terms and conditions, extended payments, and things like that. Nevertheless, uh, you need to routinely communicate every single day with your customers. That's really important. Now we need to look at the suppliers because continuity demand uh, will, will be a misstep if you don't have continuity of supply. As I said earlier, it doesn't, the supply is irrelevant if you don't have demand, but if you have demand and you can't satisfy it, then you're in really big trouble. So you need to do a performance and risk assessment. What that means is you take a look at every supplier and perhaps every part, and you evaluate that very quickly, particularly the purchase parts, because they're at the bottom of the bill of material. They do more damage as they go up the bill of material than anything does in terms of delivery reliability to your customers. So you're, you're going to look at the length of the lead time. That's the left axis. You're going to look at the supplier's yield and quality variations. That's the bottom axis, axis. And those are what we refer to as supplier controlled variables. You're then going to look at the external variables, which on the right axis is the number of alternative suppliers or alternate suppliers. And the top is what we refer to as supplier environmental impact. It's not environmental in terms of uh, trees and environmental science, but the environment around the supplier and how it's impacted. So for example, in uh, St. Catharines, Ontario, it's a little industrial town over the border not far from Buffalo. And the problem is, is getting in and out of there in the wintertime. It just, it, even train tracks get snowed in. And so uh, that's an impact. If you have a factory or a supplier in Venezuela, you probably have a different set of, if you have suppliers that require container ships, you probably have a different set of impacts. But if you take a look at the two supplier variables and you converge those and you look at that red dot up there in the yellow top left quadrant, that effectively says that from a supplier perspective, that part or that item or that particular vendor is kind of a manageable risk. Sure, the lead time is long and the yield and quality variations are about average, but that can be managed. Now, when you look at the external variables and you discover there's very few alternative suppliers and you discover that there's a reasonably high amount of environmental impactants, that gives you the convergence of those, gives you that blue dot connect the blue with the red and you can see most of the connection, most of the area under the, the theoretical two dots um, is in the high risk area. That high risk area is where you have very few alternate suppliers where existing suppliers have a lot of things that can impact them, where they have high quality and yield variations and where they, and, and ultimately where they have very long lead times. What you want is you want suppliers down the low risk area. Those I don't worry about even in times like this. It's the ones in the top that I worry about. And you need to go on each one of those ones in the top, you need to assess their performance. And I'll show you in a minute how you do that, but you need to assess the performance. Now we do this for a living. We've actually done a lot of these, about 170 of them globally now. And we could certainly teach any company to do this. Lisa, we ought to do a workshop over at the chapter on how to do these so people can learn how to do these if they don't already do them. Absolutely, and that's a great idea, Will. We'll note yeah. that, Alan. Yeah. And there, are, and, and, there are two questions here. I don't know if you have time to okay. answer them, but one says, uh, might we move the blocks that cover part of the slide? Uh, um, not sure what that means. Blocks covering though. part of the slide, really? Yeah, I'm not sure. And I'm then, not sure um, either. 
So just go ahead, Mike, just go ahead and email us that question and we'll answer it later yeah. <laughs> or join our Apex workshop and we will go over it. And then the other one says, uh, how would you handle China made parts in a highly regulated industry? How would you, how do you go about making part changes without requalification? Yeah, so this is, this is part of the reason we do that assessment real quick. And this is, would actually be part of that assessment. Um, we, let's face it, we are all at enormous risks right now with, um, with Asian suppliers and predominantly Chinese suppliers. We're at uh, economic risk, we're at uh, supply chain fulfillment risk, and we're also um, at political risk. Uh, I fear that there'll be an overreaction and we'll just shut it down. There'll be economic uh, retaliation. Uh, we've done plenty of assessments in Asia and particularly in China um, over the last decade. And, and, and I, I can tell you that about 25% of everything made in China uh, can be made in Mexico or the US for comparable costs. Uh, because uh, labor is so inexpensive and automation is ultimately on an incremental basis so inexpensive also. And now with a, with a, uh, a, a dropping of the dollar, because the dollar is gonna de decrease in value, uh, that would make our exports much uh, more favorable. So I think right now, when you take a look, you're gonna have to go find qualified suppliers. Your procurement organization also needs to be living on cots uh, next to their desk because they need to find, if you have Chinese suppliers, you cannot accept the risk of the of the Chinese border being shut down to the US. It's too high of a risk now. You need to start looking for alternate sources of supply or building them. And so that what that means uh, to the person who asked that question is from a supplier performance uh, perspective, you need to get real serious about, um, uh, about qualifying new suppliers. That's gotta go to the top of your list. That's what this supplier performance and risk assessment is. If I have a supplier that's important to me, but there's 250 of them elsewhere in the world, I, I don't probably need to worry about it so much, but it's those critical ones. Well, I want to move you, on. We, is, will, we will take you up on that offer so we can come back to that topic. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you want to probably also think about increasing your safety stocks. Inventory is the giant sucking sound of capital. I get that, but this is definitely a time to be thinking about safety stocks. Um, and looking at them. And, and part of that is when the supplier tells you the lead time's now gone from 18 weeks to 32 weeks because of their bull whip. Remember the bull whip goes all the way, all the way down the channels. Um, then you know, the single biggest determinant of safety stock, of course, is lead time. And so there's a natural time right now to be updating your lead times. And then of course, there's the bottom there improving the processes for qualifying suppliers, which by the way means speeding it up. And, and, you know, if there's any organization that should probably be hiring in your company, it should be either your quality organization or your purchasing organization or both, whoever does your new supplier qualifications. So the performance and risk assessments, um, this is actually from, from one of our sales tools and it lists the 19 areas of risk. The first 11 are the ones you need to worry about. So um, the chapter will provide you with a PDF of this so you don't have to write all this down or if you can take a snapshot of it while we're uh, while I'm teaching, go ahead and do that. But it's those, those first 11 are the ones that are gonna really hurt you. The supplier's economic viability, you don't have to go see a supplier to evaluate that. Their production processes, you do need to go see them or at least have somebody run a camera through their operation and you watch it remotely. And how they manage their inventories, how they manage their logistics, et cetera, and how they manage their catastrophes. But the big one is that economic viability right now. That's important. And every one of those, you're going to identify every one of those first 11 provides a substantial risk, a critical risk, a moderate or manageable or minor or no risk at all. And then you put a composite together for all of those. Again, we can show you how to do that. I also want you to prepare for the bullwhip. The bullwhip is coming. The problem is you're going to experience both a demand and a supply bullwhip. Oh, and it's going to get worse. I'll show you that in a minute. There's going to be a supply and a bull. We've all, there's not a person alive in supply chain world who's experienced a large scale simultaneous demand and supply bullwhip. This is chartered new territory, new chartered territory for all of us. All of us have dealt with the bullwhip effect and the channel bullwhip effect, but never on a large scale and never and never both at the same time. And companies, I predict that don't begin thinking about this now staffing up for it, figuring out where the supply channels originate from. 
um, they're going to go out of business. They're not going to survive this. Because what will happen is your accounts payable and receivable will get completely out of whack. And you'll, you'll end up in the cash flow valley of death. There's, again, laws of nature, laws of you know, economics here. And this, law of e this is a clear law of economics. You can't have receivables and payables seriously out of whack um, and, uh, and end up in the cash flow valley of death and survive. Fifth is destruction of business models. So rationalize your customers, decide what customers you need to keep. Rationalize the way you go to market. Is this really still a business to consumer business or is it a, is it a business to channel to consumer market? Um, a lot of people think Amazon is a business to consumer market. No, it's really a business to a channel to a consumer market because Amazon is the channel uh, in between the consumer and the, uh, and the uh, producer of the product except for those products perhaps Amazon produces. Expect remote work to increase, so you need to evaluate your bricks and mortar investments. Uh, work, the fundamentals of work will likely be redefined, at least for those mobile workforce people. You might wanna think of where supply is gonna come from. You know, somebody on the television the other night and one of the news stations said, you know, you, we all went to China or to Asia for a low cost product, but now if we add the increment of the $2.2 .2 trillion stimulus package to every product we bought, it might not have been all that cheap on a total cost basis. Just no way of knowing that. But it was an interesting mind uh, per view or perspective uh, to suggest that total cost and long-term cost is where we should go. Now, you noticed I said earlier we should be focusing on terms and conditions a lot, not just focusing on price, particularly with our suppliers, but also with our customers. It might be time to think of uh, getting rid of some businesses or integrating with some other business or even vertically integrating or breaking the vertical integrations if necessary or adding them. In other words, I'm, I don't think mergers and acquisitions are totally off the table right now, but the ones that help you to survive what I'm going to call the supply chain pandemic will be worthy to look at. So those that can give you the channel management that you might need probably are worth looking at. Like I said earlier, uh, this business model of traveling globally for meetings is likely going to change dramatically. So here's your action item. Rationalize and prioritize your customers and products. Get rid, time to get rid of the losers as much as you can. Keep the winners, keep the stars, get rid, of the, get rid of the losing products and plants and things that don't add value to survival. Now, com regulatory compliance is going to be an interesting one. So you, I want you to evaluate your important compliance requirements. You're gonna have a team that's gonna do that. I want you to evaluate the impact of non-compliance on every compliance requirement that you have. I want you to think about that. I want you to evaluate the cost. Then I want you to identify compliance requirements that will likely be adjusted during the current period of uncertainty. Well, the government already, already moved out personal taxes to July 15th. So, I don't think any of us this last week have been sitting around calculating taxes. Um, maybe a few have because they've had the time on their hands, but the fact is it's been moved out and there's no penalties and there's no interest applied to it. So, so if you owe money, uh, do not file your taxes until July. If you, if you are owed money, then get them out now. Get them out while you can to build that cash. I want you to build an updated compliance plan that reflects the current economic reality. And that means that some things you might push off, even if there's some level of penalties, you'll have to make those decisions yourself. And those decisions are all going to revolve around the probability of a failure or the probability of a defect that the compliance is trying to regulate, the severity and the consequences. I have some clients where they're looking at consequences and saying, and we're not talking about safety issues, things that hurt people. We're talking about forms not getting in on time and the consequences are a thousand dollar a quarter fine and they're going push it off. It's the least of our worry right now. I don't know an HR department that doesn't get a survey request a week from some government agency or some think tank. And, and I'm trying to convince them if, it's, if there's not a value in it to you or if it costs you too much money, throw it away. You just don't have time to deal with that right now. And I know you may say, well, I, I, I want to help out, but it's not, it's not the time to be doing that. We need to be thinking about how to survive and how to grow our business. So have one of your teams put together a prioritization plan for compliance. Now we get 
to the big stuff and then we'll wrap it up. So the emergence of the new business models, um, all new business models start with a view towards customers. So customers are gonna be thinking about the world differently when this is all over. Employees are gonna be working remotely. Gig workers are gonna be involved in your team. By the way, we call them gig workers. We used to call them 1099 workers. But now they're gig workers and, and so we make, and by the way, in California, this is problematic because of the laws, but in a lot of other states, it's not. And so we have to deal with how we're gonna integrate those kinds of workers. Onshoring is gonna be a new big model. I tell you something, I am pretty sure that our government, the US government, is going to look at a certain category of pharmaceuticals and maybe even medical devices, and is probably gonna de declare under national defense policy that those have to be made in the US or by a friendly con company or country. And so we're gonna see some onshoring. By the way, in case you haven't heard it anywhere else, you've heard it here. Mexico can likely be the big, big winner here because the Mexican border towns, if they can keep themselves clean and honest, can be an enormous winner in this, in this case because uh, some, it's not about labor cost either, it's about talent. It's about the enormous amount of talent that's available in or close to those borders. Uh, logistics, once we get it all sorted out, uh, and the distribution centers, better known as channel intermediaries, um, they're gonna do business differently as well. So I expect channel intermediaries to, de to demand more transparency into your customer's demand uh, or into your supplier's movements uh, than ever before so they can see how much inventory is in the channels uh, because in the, in the food chain of supplier, intermediary, um, manufacturer, usually in every time there's an economic problem, it's the intermediary that goes first. They're the ones that end up in trouble first. So we can expect them to create some new thinking. Because we know what happened at the beginning of first quarter with, I'm sorry, third quarter of last year with oil, and because we knew of what was happening in the middle of the fourth quarter last year in terms of margins um, and over leveraging in the securities world, and because we knew as early as early December that there was a potential pandemic um, and knew certainly by the middle of January that there was a definite pandemic, um, you might wanna tell your demand planners, it's no longer good enough to just have historical data, present data from the marketplace and product and marketing plans from your marketing organization to help you formulate a forecast. You need to also have macroeconomic data as well. Had you included macroeconomic data, this probably wouldn't have been as big an issue. I actually have a client um, in Europe uh, that runs and does that. And their demand planners are some of the best I've ever seen. And they have that fourth leg, as they like to call macroeconomics, that's the fourth leg of the three-legged stool of forecasting. And that has caused them to predict what was going on with oil. They're in the oil, servicing the oil industry business. And they started winding their business down last June. Last June, they started winding things down in, in anticipation of this. So the action is start looking for emerging business models and you also have a tool in your tool chest that every Apex member knows about and that's the voice of the customer review. Look it up on the internet if you don't know how to do it. Again, there's uh, 22,000 emails or, or videos on that. And again, expect to transform your enterprise after the crisis has passed. There'll be technical, organizational, and cultural issues that you'll have to address. The technical, uh, issues are always the ones that people focus on. So if the, the first question there, what impediment is easiest to overcome, that's the technical because that's just about capital, time, and innovation. But what really drives transformation is how you manage the organization, aka the people, the beliefs and value systems of your company, that's called the culture, and the individual behaviors in your company. So part of the individual behaviors, by the way, is getting rid of unnecessary performance metrics that people spend a lifetime gathering data and nobody uses it. So in case uh, you're wondering, here's a little, little message that I think will help out. And I always ask this question uh, to young people in my next generation leadership programs. I always ask them, what's the point of a metric? And they all come up with a variety of answers until they realize that the, the only correct answer is you measure in order to shape behavior. And that's not shaping behavior of a piece of equipment, that's shaping behavior of a person. So if what you measure, I don't care if it's you know, uh, inventory levels or uh, throughput time on the factory or payable time or receivable, I don't care what it is. If it doesn't shape behavior, stop wasting your time, particularly in this time of crisis, stop wasting your time and get rid of it. 
So I want you to build a transformation possibilities board, put it as close to the door that every employee in the company comes through and have everybody, but particularly the leaders and the critical support people, uh, write down their crazy thoughts about how we can transform this business, how we can not become the company that invented the digital camera but couldn't walk away from film, how not to become the company that invented the consumer video market and not walk away from 3,000 stores when the uh, direct-to-video digital marketing, a.k.a. Netflix and Hulu, were developing. In other words, how not to let your business get obsoleted. So here's your last moment of wisdom for the session. Enterprise transformation can only be achieved by addressing all four of those after your survival. So let me wrap, start to wrap this up. I want to give you the things that are really going to be problematic in the global supply chain restart. One, ocean ships, we just did a big analysis of this early in, earlier in the week, or actually late last week, Friday, and ocean ships are mostly in the wrong places now. And so if you think about it, we have about 202, or I don't know what the number is now, of ships off the West Coast waiting to be unloaded. All those crews, except for the, the, the basic crews the, to, to run them, the skeleton crews to keep them alive, keep them floating, all the crews have been sent home to countries most of them can't get back from. And so all the ships are in the wrong place. By the way, so are all the containers. So the same with the inventory. There's inventory building in China, and there's no way to get it here. And so we're going to have that material bullwhip effect, but now we have the transportation bullwhip effect on top of that. Remember I told you earlier it was going to get worse. You have a demand bullwhip, you have a supply bullwhip, and you have a transportation logistics bullwhip. That's why if anybody tells you if this ended on June 30th, we'd be back in business by the end of July. That is laughable. That is not going to happen. There are too many global complexities in this globe, this earth behind me. And so we're going to have to deal with those. We're going to have a lot of messed up suppliers. You're going to have talent who's been looking at uh, LinkedIn and is going to be mobilizing on you. The others are going to be distressed. The credit markets are going to be tight. Your bank's going to be under scrutiny. Your suppliers in Asia are going to be disrupted. And, your, uh, and so your continuous improvement projects internally are, uh, probably have stopped during this process. So they're going to have to be realigned with where you want to go. So that's what, what you need to remember. And I want you to not forget what I'm sharing here because these are the things that are going to seriously hurt you if you don't understand them now before things start to turn around. As a leader, you need to pay attention to customers, suppliers, employees, lenders, and the community. Your leaders will take care of the shareholders. But you need to talk with these every single day, every single week. You need to make sure there's complete communication and transparency between them all. Our system will not survive someone withholding facts right now. Look at what it's done with Asia or China, withholding facts uh, around the virus itself. Look at what that's caused. And so we, we cannot let that happen in our ecosystems. So I'm going to just go through these and wrap it up. You can get those. I want you to, I want to digress to wrap this up, and I want you to remember this. On January 15th, 2009, 57-year-old Captain Sully Sullenberger, who was the, the captain in charge of U.S. Airways Flight 1549, he put that Airbus A320 with 155 souls on board. He put that into the Hudson River. And there's a picture of everybody, every single person, getting out of that and getting on the wings and in the rafts and being picked up by rescue ships. It was an amazing event. It was absolutely amazing. Those were, think about 2009. This was a terrible part of the, the financial recession. And this was one of those great news stories that brought tears to all of our eyes. And what's really interesting is that he learned, because he understood that when you fly aircraft, he understood that you, your, your priorities are aviate first, never stop flying the plane, navigate second and communicate third. And in a time of crisis, you start cutting those things out in reverse order. So even as he was on approach to the Hudson River, the tower and air traffic control was still giving him directions of how to go to Teterboro. He'd already made up his mind he wasn't going to Teterboro. Simulations show and he could have possibly made it, but he could have possibly not. He's the captain of the ship. He made a decision. And he stopped communicating. He didn't say, leave me alone. He didn't say anything. He didn't even talk to the passengers. He 
stopped communicating. And then as he got lined up, he stopped navigating. He knew where he was going. He didn't have to navigate. All he had to do was focus on how to land a ship on the water and not flip it over, not bust it up. He never stopped aviating. When oftentimes when you read about a disaster, an aviation disaster, and a, and a plane flies into the side of a mountain, it's because there was a problem with the plane and the pilot and co-pilot were so involved in trying to solve the problem, looking at the gauges, the dials, the manuals, they, they lost, they stopped flying the plane and they flew it right into the side of a mountain. Don't forget to keep running your business. Don't fly your business into the side of an imbalance of payables and receivables or cash flow. Don't do that. You cannot take your eye. That's why the companies that are working, even if people are working remotely, we ought to be all working harder than we've ever worked. Not because we want to, but because we have to. So final thought. There's no rule book to, uh, to help us out here. Uh, but there is room for great leadership lessons and principles. Everyone holds a piece to this puzzle. Priorities are essential. Uh, prioritizing is essential. And prioritizing the important things is essential. Delay all the non-essential stuff. Get it out. Wipe it out of your mind. Everyone has to set aside their biases. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Anticipate coll colleagues. Back them up. And remember, for you multidivisional companies, the competition isn't within. You know, the competition is outside. This is the time for everyone in every function to be fully engaged. Tough decisions are going to have to be made and communicated with clarity, firmness, and compassion. Probably nowhere in any of our careers, mine included, Lisa's and everybody's that's listening to this, nowhere in our careers have we been faced with such a societal calamity. We've never been facing 30% unemployment. Trust your education. Be skeptical of the data feeding your decisions. And most of all, be willing to recognize past decisions that you've made that didn't work out. Apologize for them. Make a new decision and move on. That's the only way you're going to get through this. And with that, that wraps up the presentation today. Are there any questions? Lisa, did you have any questions that you wanted to? Uh, well, there, there is one, but I'm, I'm, I will ask you this one, and then I okay. uh, want to let everybody know that they can send us uh, feedback, and we will send them on to Alan. Also, we are going to uh, post this webinar and the, um, uh, and the PDF on uh, Apex and Lynn Empire's website. So that's uh, apex-ie. Dot org. So stay tuned and we'll send out a note as well. So Alan, uh, I guess the, the question to wrap it up is, how do you foresee the supply chain in Southern California, which is largest in the nation, coming out of this? Um, well, <laughs> not well. Not well. And the reason for that is, is that we also are tied. Southern California is immensely tied to Asia and particularly to China. And I worry about overreaction uh, by government officials um, on both sides of the, uh, of, of the Pacific. I, I worry about that. Um, I worry about that bullwhet because of all the containers and the ships um, and the transportation assets all being in the wrong place. And so um, I think that when it all gets sorted out, it'll be fine. But I think we're probably talking, um, and you know, predictions are always tough to make and probably shouldn't make them, but I, I think you need to be prepared for an enormously difficult 2020 all the way through the end of the year. I think this is not a first and second quarter problem. This is easily a all four quarter issue. I think that um, uh, the supply chain people, once the virus is over, the world is going to depend on the supply chain profession. In one respect, I would not want to be in any other profession other than supply chain right now. Um, That's right. I think we are in the um, opportune profession and we have opportunities for the future. And um, with right. that said, though, it'll also be challenging times. So That's right. Apex Inland Empire will be here to support you. And um, we very much appreciate uh, Alan for um, presenting this. It was really valuable information. We've got lots of feedback already and we, we very much appreciate it. And we will um, take you up on your offer to come back. So thank you. Glad to help you out anytime. Everybody be safe and be healthy. All Bye -bye right. Now. Thank you, Alan. Bye-bye.